Hey everyone, I'm Nick, and this is Bits of Architecture. So in this episode of the series, we're going to have an introduction to pipelining. So up until this point, we've been looking at our simple processor that implements a subset of the RISC-V instruction set. But we haven't really talked about the class of processors that our processor belongs to. And that's going to be this family of processors called single cycle processors. But what exactly does that mean? What is a single cycle processor? Now, a single cycle processor is just one that um, executes an entire instruction within a single clock period. So if we use our architecture as an example, we would say within a single clock period, uh, fetch an instruction from instruction memory, decode it, so access, say, the registers that we need to, and set our control lines. Then we would, say, perform whatever ALU op we need to perform. So if it's a load, say, we do an address calculation here. Then from there, we would access data memory, so do that load, so we'd read something out. And then we would write that back to a register file, all the while incrementing our program counter to go to the next instruction. And like I said, all of this work is happening within a single clock period. But one thing you may have noticed is that we don't really have single cycle processors today. All of our processors are what we call multi-cycle, or more commonly called uh, pipeline processors. So what exactly is the problem with a single cycle processor, right? Why don't we use this design today? So let's take a look at some of the costs of single cycle processors. So fundamentally, our clock rate is going to be based on this thing called our critical path. So remember, all of these different components are made out of circuits and gates, and these different circuits and gates um, have a delay, right? It takes time to propagate a signal through all of these different components. Now, in our case, in a single cycle processor, what we want to do within a single cycle is execute entire instructions. So our critical path is going to be based on uh, the longest running instruction. So which instruction has uh, the longest path through these circuits right, in terms of time? And in our case, it's going to be our load instruction. So on the right hand side of the screen here, we have this table that shows uh, the classes of instructions that we have um, and then also the uh, different hardware structures that the instruction uses. So fetch decode, um, our ALU execution, accessing data memory, and writing to a register file. So our load um, instruction takes 200 picoseconds to do a fetch, 100 to decode the instruction, 200 to do that address calculation, 200 to access data memory, so to actually do that read from that address, and then 100 to write that value back into a register file. So a total of 800 picoseconds. Now, unfortunately, with a single cycle processor, um, this critical path is going to dictate uh, the period of our clock for all of our instructions, right? Um, our clock rate is really a fixed thing, right? So we're going to fix that clock period based upon the longest uh, duration instruction here, which takes 800 total picoseconds. So the, even though stores only take 700 picoseconds, our type instructions only take 600 picoseconds, and branch instructions only take 500 picoseconds, uh, because we're executing a single instruction every cycle here, and we need at least 800 picoseconds in that clock period, every single one of our instructions is going to take 800 picoseconds here. Um, so that's one of the uh, one of the problems that we have with our um, with our single cycle processors. Now, to understand some of the other uh, performance challenges we have with single cycle processors, let's look at the execution over time. So here we have uh, a timeline of instructions. So on the y-axis, we have the instruction number. So I1, I2, and I3. And on the x-axis, we have our time in picoseconds. And I've done it in 800 picosecond increments because that's our clock period. So in the first 800 picoseconds, we fully execute our first instruction, I1. So we do fetch, decode, execute memory, and I'll write back to our register file. And then in the next 800 uh, picoseconds, unsurprisingly, we execute instruction two. And in our next 800, we execute instruction three. Now, one of the problems you may have noticed here is that we're not really utilizing um, our hardware structures to the best of their ability. So we talked about how long it takes for a signal to propagate through these different hardware structures. So for example, for our fetch, it only took 200 picoseconds. But you can see here, our fetch stage is really waiting around a long time before being asked to do another fetch. So we're not really utilizing it, uh, that hardware structure, all that well. We could be doing a whole lot more fetches during this kind of empty space right here. And that's where we get this idea of pipelining from. 
So we want to be able to overlap um, the execution of our instructions so we can better utilize uh, these hardware structures that we have and kind of push them to the max rate um, at which they're able to perform. So let's go ahead and talk a little bit about pipelining and how we're going to change things up with our processor. So instead of doing all of our work inside of a single cycle, all of our work being executing an entire instruction, what we're going to do in a single cycle is just one stage of the work. So our fetch stage, our decode stage, our ALU stage, our data memory stage, or our register write stage, right? We're going to execute just one of those stages for each of our instructions every single cycle. And there are some pros and some cons to this, right? It's not completely perfect, uh, or it's not just all uh, sunshine and daisies. So some of the pros that we have uh, for this pipeline approach is that we can improve our, uh, our clock rate quite significantly, right? Because instead of um, our clock rate depending on the longest running instruction, it's going to depend on the longest running stage, right? Because our work item now is a stage of execution, not an entire instruction. So we just need to see what our longest, uh, uh, what stage takes the longest to execute. So in our case, it's going to be fetch, ALU, and data memory. Each of these takes 200 picoseconds. So we can improve our clock period from 800 picoseconds uh, to 200 pic picoseconds, basically a 4x improvement. Um, another benefit that we have of pipelining is we can now overlap instructions because we're not doing all of our work inside of a single clock cycle. One instruction can be doing fetch while another is doing decode, while another is doing... Um, you know, its execution stage, while another is doing its memory stage, while another is doing its uh, write back stage, right? Because we're just doing a single stage of work inside of a, a cycle, right? So we can overlap the execution of multiple uh, instructions now. Now there are some cons too. So inherently we're going to make a more complex core now. We're going to have to maintain some more state. And we're also going to introduce these things called hazards, right? So in our previous single cycle implementation, these hazards just didn't exist. When one instruction was executing, the previous instructions had already completed. But now, because we're overlapping instructions, we're going to have partially executed instructions in the pipeline. And we may have dependencies between those instructions. So for example, we may be doing an add instruction followed by a branch instruction. And that branch is going to want to use the result of that add instruction. But that branch is now going to have to wait for that um, the add instructions to completely finish and write the result back to a register before it can go ahead and say, you know, compare that value for say a branch of equal. So we're going to have these hazards as well, right? Which may introduce bubbles inside of our pipeline. And we'll get into that in more detail in later videos. So to understand the benefits of pipeline a little bit more, let's go ahead and take a look at this, uh, this new execution timeline. So uh, the exact same format, um, I1, I2, and I3 on the y-axis, and then our clock period in uh, picoseconds on the x-axis. And we can see in the first clock period, we start fetch for instruction one. In the second clock period, uh, we start decode for instruction one while uh, I2 begins fetch. And then by the third clock period, um, I1 begins execution, uh, I2 begins decode and I3 begins fetch. So you can see we're starting to overlap the execution of multiple instructions. And so every single cycle, we're doing a fetch. Every single cycle, uh, we're doing a decode, we're doing an execute, we're doing a memory, and we're doing a write back. You can just extend this out if we had, you know, you know hundreds or thousands of instructions, right? We're fully utilizing all of these different components uh, inside of our pipeline. Now, one of the little downsides here that you may have noticed is that the time it takes to execute an, a single instruction actually increased a little bit compared to um, our single cycle processor because we had to pad out our decode and our writeback stage. Uh, those two stages took 100 picoseconds. And we had to pad them out to 200 picoseconds because our critical path for our uh, pipeline stages was 200 picoseconds. Um, so now in order to fully execute a single instruction, right? It takes a thousand uh, total picoseconds to go from fetch all the way to write back for a single instruction. But what we lost there in terms of instructions taking a little bit longer uh, to execute, say, for a single instruction, we now have this overlap and this parallelism, which actually means that we can complete uh, instructions at a must, much faster rate. In fact, we'll see that um, at steady state, we can actually complete instructions um, 
every single cycle, right? So every 200 picoseconds, we can complete uh, a new instruction. So let's go ahead and talk about that uh, for a little bit, right? The performance of our pipeline processor. So what is our speed up that we get from pipelining? Now our speed up ideally is equal to the number of pipeline stages. So if we have a five stage processor um, or five stage pipeline, we should ideally get 5x performance. Now by ideally, what we mean is that we have pipeline stages that are perfectly balanced, right? So every pipeline stage takes the exact same amount of time, right? Now, unfortunately, this is rarely the case, just like we saw. Um, so our, our, our decode stage and our write back stage um, only took 100 picoseconds instead of 200 picoseconds. So we get a little bit less performance improvement here because we had that extra padding that went in. Now, at steady state, you know, what's going on inside our processors? Well, for our single cycle processor, it's pretty intuitive. At steady state, we're just, in, we're just uh, uh, completing a single instruction every single cycle, right? Because every cycle we do one instruction by definition for a single cycle processor. Now at steady state for a pipeline processor, what exactly does that mean, right? Now, when we first begin execution inside of a pipeline processor, there's nothing in the pipeline. So there's no actual overlap of instructions. So we have to wait until we start executing multiple instructions to actually see that overlap. And eventually, once we you know, put more and more instructions into that pipeline, we end up fully saturating all of the execution units. And eventually we get to this state where if we go ahead and go back here, we see that every 200 picoseconds, we're finishing or doing this right back stage of another instruction. So you can just kind of extend that graph out um, above and below and pretend we're just in the middle of some program with thousands or millions of instructions. So every 200 picoseconds now, we're now finishing an instruction. Every single clock cycle, we're finishing an instruction. Just like our single cycle case, we just have to get to this point, right, where our pipeline is uh, is full, right? It's not uh, in this fiddle stage. So in that case, right, if we're talking purely about uh, in this steady state, uh, we can compare the performance of our single cycle processor to our pipeline. So our single cycle processor completes one instruction every 800 picoseconds. And at steady state, our pipeline processor is completing one instruction every 200 picoseconds for our particular implementation. And if we take the ratio of that, we get 800 picoseconds over 200 picoseconds, which gives us that 4x speed up, right? So by adding these five pipeline stages, we got a 4x speed up in this case. Okay, so that's a brief introduction to pipelining. We're of course going to go into much more details about things like hazards and some of the additional overheads um, and limitations we have to pipelining. Right, we can't just infinitely increase the number of pipeline stages we have and expect to see you know, increased performance. But we'll go into all those details in some of these later videos. But that's going to go ahead and do it for today. As always, I'm Nick, and I hope you have a nice day.